Hello and welcome to Factual Animation Film Festival 2020. Um, I'm Alex Widdison. I'm here today with John Lee Robert. No, John Robert <laughs> Lee. Okay, I'll do that again. Um, you ready? Yeah. Hello and welcome to Factual Animation Film Festival 2020. My name is Alex Widdison. I'm here with John Robert Lee, the director of Not For Money, Not For Love, Not For Nothing. Um, before we talk about the film with John, I'm going to just remind everybody we have tickets available for our online screening of the festival. It will be running for a week, starting the 17th of October 2020. So follow the link below in this video and you can purchase a ticket for yourself. So, Rob, um, so John, uh, <laughs> I'm going to make an edit there. So, John. Would you um, mind telling us about the context in which you conceived this project, how it began, how you gained access with your participants? It's a, it's a bit of a unique one with this project because it actually started quite a few years ago, um, actually as a student project. And as you can imagine with the subject matter, it was quite weighty for, for a student film. Um, but it started out as wanting to fulfill the brief of uh, a documentary within Newport, because um, that's where we were studying at the time and we wanted uh, interesting perspectives and voices within Newport. Um, we came across a, um, it's this group of people called Shurek, where they, they have different connections on, on marginalized communities and they sort of are a hub of um, social workers and things like that. And through them, we, in, um, we were introduced to Paula, who's obviously an outreach worker working for vulnerable women in general, but more specifically with sex workers. Um, and in that time frame, we, we did several interviews with Paula, but we also followed her around in her day-to-day -day, um, tasks and the, the jobs that she fulfilled, but she also introduced us to a brothel, one, one specific brothel run by um, Joe, who's featured in the film. And then within that brothel, there were about four or five different sex workers who were happy to, to give us interviews. It sort of did its thing for a student film. As you can imagine, it was just kind of a bit, a bit flat and wasn't really doing such a powerful story justice. And it, it kind of just disappeared on our minds. We, we got on with our lives and that sort of thing. And then just a few years ago, it just, I don't know, just one night it suddenly dawned on me that, that we've got these amazing, incredible interviews and this is such an important story. And I remembered all of these um, discussions we were having with Paula around consent, in particular in, in the sex trade and, and that kind of blurred line um, about overcoming uh, abusive relationships. And this was actually just before the Me Too movement, actually, that just kind of dawned on me that this was here. But it, it was interesting conversations I was having at the time. So I just kind of went to Cardiff again to, to meet the producer, picked up the hard drive, and then just in my spare time, just started editing it and trying to find what the story was. The first edit was a 60 minute film, uh, um, and that wasn't the story. And then it just kind of got refined and refined until we found out what the story is in this iteration. And um, I took it from there, basically. So anonymity is a, a sort of key aspect within the film. Um, there's a relationship between animation and live action in this project. Do you want to tell us a little bit about those decisions and uh, the sort of safeguards there? Yeah. Well, um, I th I'd say firstly that um, the decision to use animation was not uh, exclusively around anonym anonymity. <laughs> anonymity. Um, it's it, it, it helps with it, but you know I'm sure you've seen other sex worker films where perhaps they sort of shadow out the face or get an actor involved or some people are happy to talk on camera but obviously you won't get the same access if they're exposing themselves. Um, it was a joint decision to actually not just in case of um, the identity but also for um, telling a story in through animation and it's something that um, I was always fascinated in using and the team in general really liked the idea of being able to illustrate beyond talking heads and particularly when you haven't got a head <laughs> on screen, uh, you want to be able to find unique ways and we found that with animation you could 
you know, bend the realms of reality a little bit and be really metaphorical, which in some cases where there was one interviewee, Amelia, who speaks very, very metaphorically. She talks about feeling like she's a chicken in a supermarket packaged and prepared. And when you pay for it, you get to do what you want with it. And when you sort of take that metaphor and run with it, it's, it's great. But then you've got others who are being very, very literal with their, um, with their interviews. And the animation just kind of gave it a new dimension where we weren't necessarily illustrating them and their personalities and their faces. It was or them talking. It was about their story and all these disconnected parts that then sort of came together in one visual space. I mean, when when that metaphor did come up, I had sort of flashbacks to Harvey Keitel's awful character in Taxi Driver, oh, where yeah. he uses a similar analogy in a much more um, well, in a similarly sin sinister way, actually. But um, anyway, uh, so. Um, we have Paula, who is a born again Christian, who uh, is on a mission, and she sort of bookends the project. Well, she sort of we have a section of live action with her towards the end. How did you marry the two in this uh, in this project? This sort of relationship between animation and live action. Uh, it was really challenging. Really challenging. Um, it was when we were looking at perhaps a longer film. You know, like I said, the first edit we were looking at. 60 minutes thinking it's probably going to get down to 30. Um, the story was kind of Paula, right? And she, even though she's bookending this, she was the thread throughout. So we'd go back to Paula, back to an animation, back to Paula, back to an animation. And that kind of blends quite nicely when you, you're reminding the audience, oh, there is live action as well, here's animation. And it was way, and it didn't feel so jolted at that point. Um, but instead, we wanted to take it away from that thread and make it um five stories and paula is one of those stories um and having the animation kind of in bulk in the middle was a challenge because you you sort of set yourself up with the live action and then all of a sudden bam it's animation and then you don't revisit it in, in for a while so a couple of the things that we did was introduce paula into the animation so she was there for the interview so there's one point where Joe's talking and um, she talks about the person that, that pimped her and she throws out this comment and he's still an arsehole to this day. And then they both crack up laughing together, which in itself was just this wonderful thing when she's telling this really complex and, and dark story to suddenly have this burst of laughter. And there's so much light in the voice there that we wanted to include that. And we show Paula in animation form. So that was one area where we sort of are reminding the audience that Paula, the live action person, is, is very much involved in these stories. Um, and so we kind of just, when we were bookending, we started with Paula visiting Joe's house. We animated that and that kind of segued nicely into it. But I would say it's really hard to blend live action animation um, mm -hmm. and something that I'd like to, to revisit doing and perhaps having a clearer vision of, of how to execute it. Um, but yeah, there's obviously towards the end, we sort of have, we, we have chapter points throughout the whole thing of Joe's story, Amelia's story, da, 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 da. and just before we introduced Paula again, we, we had Paula's story as a title card in animation. So that kind of blends it nicely, I guess, but we, we, it was a challenge for sure. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, well, it always would be to, uh, to marry such diff disparate um, sort of visual styles. Um, so working with your animator, I mean, I, I understand you come from a live action background and you collaborated with an animator on this project. How did that process go and what was your working method? So the animator was Ola Schmieder and um, we had originally worked together on a commercial project. Um, as you do, you sort of blend these into, into the, the sort of more creative stuff. Um, so I knew her art style. And quite early on, we, I kind of knew that we wanted to go in that direction of this kind of pencil sketches and the way that they are then, um, that these micro movements that are then repeated. Um, and I thought her simplistic, well, not when I say simplistic, I mean kind of stripped back style was really nice for getting inside a, um, like a person's psyche, you know, like it's, it's 
them telling their personal story. And this is like sketches on a sketch pad. It's kind of not a finished article uh, yeah. that's got sort of brush strokes in it. It's, it's very much kind of in this kind of mindset, in this head space. Um, so her, her style was very, very suited to the project from the off. In terms of our process, um, it, it actually worked really nicely. I, one of the big learning curves from this project was just how collaborative filmmaking is in general. And you kind of have to allow people the space to be able to uh, input their own vision because you can easily be blindsided by your own. And um, one of the things that we established really early on was that you, I sort of went through the, the scripts of, of each of the interviews and then I sort of came up with some, some ideas, but they weren't really working. I'm not that kind of thinker. I'm not, I'm not an artist in, in, in that sense, in the painting sense. And um, I, I, Ola wanted to, to give her own input and to come up with some ideas and that sort of thing. So the process that we worked out was that before she would start storyboarding, we would have a meeting where um, we could discuss what the interview, you know, the depths of the interview. So I could give her context that is outside of that edit. So, you know, maybe mentioning that, oh, well, you know, um, Amelia is very full of frustrations and she, she, she pushes that frustration towards men and she's kind of got this anger around her. So we kind of, Ola took with that, okay, it's, it's about men. It's about the way she sees men. And so she came up with this idea of lining the men up. So she was very much leading the, the, the visual narrative um, with my input on terms of what's the story, what's the theme that we're telling with this interview. And, and that process worked really, really nicely where it wasn't a case of me going, oh, Ola, could you draw us a chicken in a, on a supermarket shelf? Because it, where's the creativity in that? She was able to, to say, here's an idea that I had. And obviously I'd give feedback and, and direction on that. But most of the time it was kind of just always spot on pretty much. So that was our process. That sounds like a very exciting project and a very important project as well, as well to be involved in. So um, yeah, John, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. I'd like to remind the audience that we have um, tickets available for the actual festival screening from the 17th of October 2020 and there'll be a link below if you'd like to purchase a ticket. So thank you again, this has been Factual Animation Film Festival and thank you John. Thank you very much.